Welcome to Collector's Corner, the premier digital art platform. We help collectors gain and maintain their edge, all while appreciating beautiful art. Let's jump in. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Into the Collection with Collector's Corner. My name is P. You may know me online as Aston Cloud. I'm one of your hosts. I'm joined by my co-host, Jared. You may know him online as Jared underscore pause. How are you doing today, Jared? Doing really well, man. I'm all rested up uh, from the last week being off, so ready to get back into it. Excellent, excellent. We have an amazing episode today. Yes, I'm going to, even before we start, say it's going to be amazing because we've already been doing research on it. We're talking about Terraforms, and we have two really prominent folks in the Terraforms community with us to do a Terraforms 101 because this is a really interesting and in in depth collection, you can go really deep, and so we have he and Matto with us to explain and talk you all through Terraform 101, and and to be honest, to talk us a little bit through Terraform 101. And before jumping in and and kind of hand, checking in with our guests, this is a video episode primarily. We will also have audio, but you really want to see this on video because Terraforms is animated motion art, and that's why we'll have this video up here. Don't have a DECA gallery for that reason for this episode. We'll be going through the Terraform Explorer live. So that is our episode. It's going to be super fun. Really excited. Before we talk shop, he and Matto, how are you doing? Doing good, man. Thanks for having us on. Yeah, uh, I'm great. And I think about Terraforms constantly, so I'm happy to talk about them for a bit. Awesome, awesome. Well, we've been thinking about them uh, a lot lately, and it, it seems like a lot of folks have as well. And... Before we dive into all the nuances, maybe could you all talk about how you discovered Terraforms and sort of what, maybe what sucked you in? We'll, we'll do a bit of a tease for the listeners and, and maybe he you can go first and, and then Matto. Oh, uh, sure. Yeah. I sort of knew Zoltgeist and I knew 113 pretty well. And the, that's the duo that is Math Castle Studio before they made the project. So I was kind of, I had been looking forward to something from them for a couple of months before it came out, although I didn't really know what. And then October-ish, 2021, 113 would occasionally do impromptu streams in the Discord server, not announced publicly, so you just kind of had to be there to see them. But they were sort of teasers of this rotating 3D object with a sparse description of what it might be and nothing else. It was somewhat mysterious. But so I, I sort of... I've been following intently since a couple of months before the project was released for that reason. Yeah, and then for myself, I found out about it shortly after the release. Um, this would have been mid-December, I would guess, something like that, and uh, in 2021. And I found out about it through a Twitter Spaces that a guy named Nicholas was holding, and I got on there and was chatting with them, and then uh, jumped in the Discord, met 113, was really taken by the artwork and also just by the kind of energy of the community and, and, uh, and plunged in. Amazing. And just one other quick background question. Uh, did you immediately get drawn to it, or did it take a little while and a little bit of understanding before you really became enthusiasts? I would say understanding is sort of like a persistent journey and not a destination. <laughs> I was obsessed with them before I really understood what they were. Now I think I have a much clearer understanding of what they are, but the thing is it's kind of a moving target. So, um, and also there's just like, there are so many different perspectives you can adopt to sort of have an appreciation for them that uh, it takes a while to sort of walk through all of them, I think. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. I mean, I was definitely very dr drawn to them pretty much right away because it was kind of, there were kind of like, it was giving off signals of a lot of stuff that I was already very interested in. Things like kind of procedural world generation and ASCII art and this kind of stuff. So there were a lot of kind of like aesthetic reference that grabbed me right away. Uh, and then the more I learned, the more I, you know, the more I got kind of drawn in. Well, amazing. I'm excited to, uh, for you all to, to take us down the rabbit hole. So maybe we could just start with the basics. And for folks listening, Matt has a fantastic 
YouTube video that he's put up. I'm going to show it on the screen here, and this will be in our show notes. That is a great one, kind of like an overview 101. And there are a few other resources that we'll reference all be in the show notes. But Matt, maybe, uh, or, or you guys can tag team it. Maybe you could give us sort of just the, the basic overview. Where would you start with someone who's not familiar with the project? Yeah, I mean, it's the basic overview, depending on where you want to go with it can take a while. But I think like, the first thing to know about the project is that it's a kind of a multi-layered project in, in many different ways. And that there's, you kind of move through levels of abstraction and understanding it. On one level, there's an animated artwork, which is the kind of surface level and is usually the first thing that people encounter. Then there's this idea of a 3D space. So the each of the animated artworks is a space in a grid, which is then layered in, in 20 layers in 3D. So we can think about a kind of a three, each NFT token being a kind of a part of a 3D coordinate space. Then, and this is kind of one of the understandings that's kind of become more clear and kind of more central, I think, over the life of the piece and over the past year, there's this idea of it as a kind of a dynamically calculated runtime artwork, right? So as opposed to being a recording of an output or of a process or an image or even a more moving image, it's it's actually a dynamic computer program that's being calculated on Ethereum. And I think that's maybe one of the more important and unique parts of the work and kind of one of the things that I think will become more important about the piece over time. Uh, one, one thing I would, would add to that answer, which is perfect um, otherwise, is that another sort of so-called basic component of, of the uh, sort of Terraforms at launch is that they are also a substrate for people creating art on them, if you want. So they, they arrive in sort of this base terrain mode, but they can be daydreamed and then people can create 2D or 3D artworks, depending on how you want to interpret them on, on top of these terrains that are written to chain. So there's also this sort of, in addition to the 3D space and the 2D art concepts and the concept of this, instead of this being a static output from an algorithm like a Fidenza, for example, this is sort of something that it changes over time. It's also this sort of like a multiplayer art experience. But 113 likes the, the phrase multiplayer art computer to describe sort of the direction that they're heading in as a studio with concepts like that one. So I'm gonna hop in here because one of the pieces that I loved coming out of the YouTube video that Matto put together was the the visualization of how each specific NFT really represents a, for lack of better terms, plot of land within a greater 3D structure. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but the levels designation that is, I'll call it commonly viewed within, you know, on OpenSea or I'm looking here on article, that's indicative of where in that 3D structure it resides. Is that a fair statement? The level corresponds to the, you can think of it as the height axis in the piece. Uh, so you have kind of width and depth, which are the coordinates. Like if you see level five, six, seven, right? That would be five would be height and then six and seven would be width and depth. Yeah, absolutely. And that that's uh I, I love that you brought that up, Jared, because this is the what they call the hyper castle. And effectively the level is your Z coordinate. If you're thinking like traditional Cartesian coordinates, you have your X and your Y, and then the the Z is is called the level. Is that correct? Uh, that's it's close. Um th they do have an elevation, but um as you'll see from that visualization there, the elevation varies even within the level. So the level is more like it, it's a range of elevations, I guess, in the, the structure, but there's also thematically, there are qualities that only exist on certain levels. There are a lot of the zones, for example, yeah. zones being a, essentially in, in the sort of 2D interpretation, a zone is just the color scheme, uh, the palette, but uh, there are a lot of zones that are unique to specific levels, for example, and biomes as well. Okay, perfect, perfect. So let's, uh, let's take like a, a half step back uh, because I think people might be saying like, wait, levels and what's going on? So I, I loved your structure, Matto, that you have the animated art on the, the most sort of obvious level. And then you have this 3D structure that we've been talking about. And then we have this uh, really uh, computer that is powering all this. And I'm really curious to hear 
thoughts on that. But maybe as we go over here to the Terraform Explorer, as folks can see at the top here, we have certain traits, the, the biomes, levels, and zones. So these are some high-level categories that could be spoken through. Maybe we could talk through what each of those refer to. Sure, yeah. So uh, as Matto mentioned, it's it's ASCII-esque art. Um, it's all uh, Unicode characters that are stored on Ethereum. Again, like the, the whole project is maximally on chain as sort of like an artistic constraint. And so everything that can be accessed from the, from the or for the art exists there. But um, the biome is basically just the character set. I mean, I think like maybe biome is supposed to be evocative of different types of environment or whatever, if you imagine a, a 3D world. But in literal terms, the character set is the biome. Right. So I'll, I'll click into one of these for the listeners. So we'll just take any of these here. And so if we click on this ID number, number 3283, which is showing on the screen for the folks who are listening on audio only. And so this character set, which is some skulls and uh, some, some other characters, this is the biome. So these are what make up the image that are, are often moving, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. And so basically this is a custom font that's stored on chain and then kind of subsets of that font. I forget how many characters are in each, but it's like maybe eight or 12. If you actually hit command K or control K and type like B53, you can actually see, oh, actually, let's see. No, that's just taking you to the browser. There is a way, I know it works on Mac, but you can basically uh, do, or search. If you go to the search bar and type B53, I think it'll preview for you the biome. Let's see. I don't know, maybe I'm missing I'm misleading you. There is a way to get the biome preview. I just saw it recently. He, do you know how to bring that, pull that up? I think it's command K on Mac. I'm just not sure what, what the command I is. I thought it was control PC. K on PC too, but that in a browser, I guess that just pulls up the, well, actually you can see it in the character set. If you click into the token down below the community tools list, you can actually see the character set uh, listed. Yeah, right, right over here. Yeah, right there. There they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what the artwork is made up of in this case. And that's the bi that's the biome. Perfect. So so that is the biome, and I imagine some biomes are more popular than others, based on just kind of preferences out there, and the distribution of rarity. Although I would say that with biomes in particular, a collector preference skews much more to aesthetics than with rarity. I, I think that's true of zones as well, which, which again are the color palettes. But um, I think biomes in particular, there are certain ones that people love. And uh, and they tend to gravitate toward them, and those preferences are different from person to person. But I don't like I don't I don't hear people speaking enthusiastically about the rarest set of biomes as often as I do with zones, for example. That's intriguing because I, I one of the the projects I love is called Screens by Thomas Lynn Peterson, and you know one of the I'll call it most common palettes ends up being one of the most or the the highest des, uh, most desirable from the from the biomes what uh, just if you can speak in generalities maybe even specifically are there some that you guys find either yourself or the community gravitating towards well the blocky biomes like biome zero uh i know there's a couple collectors in the discord who are like obsessed with them <laughs> Yeah, like I, I guess the low number biomes. I don't know if you can sort by number. It should show you. Yeah, all these. These are definitely very desired. Yeah, actually, I bought a blocky biome while we were on the call. Um, <laughs> Price is going up. I bought uh, I bought ID seven 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 five in in there, which is like a a, a nice simple blocky one. But th they're popular because the animations tend to look really nice. Yeah. That that's the one right there. It's a and, nice one. And, and this one, the the zone there, the red and blue zone, uh, which is called Rezo. I personally, I don't really love that car color palette. I find with a lot of the uh, the biomes, the the character set is sparse enough that you get a lot of white with just a little bit of red and blue peppering the canvas. And so blocky biomes kind of pop with that color palette. It's a lot more vibrant. So that, that's why I grabbed this one. Yeah, and this is maybe a little bit of a sidetrack, but it's a good chance to mention it while it's on the screen, is I think that one of the themes that is maybe less spoken about in Terraforms is their kind of reference to like printmaking and kind of like 
graphic design and poster design. And so the name Rezo is like a direct reference to Rezograph printing. And this is like a very, very clear, this kind of like three color, almost screen print looking design is like a very clear kind of like aesthetic reference to these kind of like aesthetics of, of uh, Rezograph printing. Oh man, there's, there's so much to this. Okay. So we'll, let's, I, I love that. And I love that little, not Easter egg, but, but that detail there that is, I think going to make part of the reason why people really enjoy this. I think there's so much nuance to this collection that it's just fascinating to dig in. So I, like with the biomes, other than those blocky ones, are there others that you all feel that are kind of more desirable or lead to better aesthetics? I mean, I, I personally, I think that there's an awful lot of um, subjectivity and personal preference baked into it. So I don't, I don't know how to answer that question comprehensively. But like, for example, if you want to look at token number 411, this one is a Biome 42. And Biome 42 and Biome 65 both have this sort of like uh, organic, grassy, like, oh, that's 4111. Uh, it's just 411. They just sort of have this like grass-like uh, texture to them. And so they, they're they really fun on zones that sort of have a color palette that leans into that. I, I think a lot of a lot of it too is like it's it's different combinations of of zone and biome and chroma that sort of pop rather than necessarily just I love this one of these features. Yeah, I agree. I think this is a great example, right? This kind of like grassland feeling. Also, I think one of the cool things about this biome is that you can see if you look at the top border, the characters are larger than the grid size. So it kind of violates the grid, which gives it this really nice, non, not so cleanly gridded look, this kind of more organic look. And there's a few pieces like that. I think these characters, these kind of squiggly line characters are actually from like a Tibetan character set, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I'd never seen these ones before. They're absolutely beautiful. Yeah, I like these a lot. I also like the not. I like the knives, the frogs, and the chess pieces. <laughs> Just personal favorites. Yeah, I'd seen some with the knives previously. They they turn out really really nicely. They're really cool. Very metal. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the chess piece biomes as well. Biome thirty nine, biome eighty five. I've collected quite a few of those. But yeah, again, like there, there are so many different preferences for these things. And also some of them just, you find the right terraform and you see a biome or a zone that you normally don't like. And it just, the whole thing works, which is cool. Interesting. Interesting. Okay, cool. Well, let, let's, let's hop over to zones really quick since they have such a big impact on the aesthetics as well as the biome. And uh, as you mentioned, these are the color palettes. And for folks listening, uh, there are over 100 of these. And uh, some are far more scarce than others. The parcel count here on the screen refers to how many NFTs there are. So it ranges from 10, at the least common, to 617 in the most common. And you can see the floor prices here. And to your point, he, these don't fully follow the rarities, um, although it sounds like a little bit more so in this case, uh, could could you talk through what tends to be most desired or or least desired to the extent there are some preferences with the crowd a and even your personal ones? We'd love to see some of the ones you guys enjoy. Uh, they're they're definitely crowd favorites. Like for example, Dynacrypts is a relatively common zone. There are two hundred. Oh wait. I can't remember how many. There are 200 and something Dynacrypts, and uh, they, 214, and they tend to carry a premium over zones that are quite a bit more scarce than them, just because people like the aesthetics of it. It's very common for people to sort of pop into the Terraforms Discord, do some research, which they're always encouraged to do before they even think about buying anything, and then maybe grab one they like. And then before too long, you see them showing up asking for people to trade them at Dynacrypts. <laughs> yeah i like these two i have one of these i think they're very beautiful yeah maybe we'll, we'll click into one so folks can see oh wow yeah it's done it kind of looks like they have a flower uh, biome in there as well you know and i would say that probably i think a lot of people start by gravitating to some of these more like multicolored zones and then later start to like pick up a taste for some of the more like two color 
you know, duotone kind of zones. I know that kind of, and actually there's a bunch of like the duotone zones that I didn't get. And that now I'm like, ah, oh, why did you do that? Like I was busy picking up like stuff with a bunch of different colors. And then uh, now I look at them and I'm like, oh, I really want these. So. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I could see that. It, it, what are other, actually, I, I like the way you phrase that. So uh, I'm going to ask you guys two questions about the zones that I think would be interesting for listeners. First question, what are other relatively common zones that are more desirable? So more desirable than their pure rarity would suggest. And then secondly, what are other you know, what are zones that people tend to gravitate towards after they've been into the project for a while? Like you were just talking about the, the duo Chrome ones, Matto. Um, are there any other things where people kind of tend to move in a predictable way? Well, I would, I would say the four most common zones are all quite attractive. And so people are pretty happily, ha happily collecting those. Those are Hollow, Hyper Mage, Night Rose, and Alto. And they're all pretty colorful. They look good in a wide variety of biomes. I think if you're getting into still fairly common, but more sought after zones, you're probably Mount Zuka is one that's very popular. And there are a few other that are sort of like, a, you know, medium rare that, you know, people tend to gravitate toward that are, are colorful. But to Matto's point, like uh, once you go a bit deeper down the rabbit hole, you discover like, oh, this this two-tone palette looks incredible with these types of biomes and this chroma or wow, like Uos and Dreads have these dark characters that make them apparently fade in. So they animate completely differently from the other parcels, for example. Yeah, definitely. Sorry, just to see what I mean about uh, the, the fade in animation, check out uh, 7061. It will give you just a sort of a sample of what a Dread animation looks like. And that happens because the the zone characters are are dark. So you sort of as it cycles through different parts of or not not characters, sorry, but colors. And so as it cycles through the colors of the zone, you get this fade in it effect on it. And, and what was that word that word you use? Dread is that the zone or is that another characteristic? This is this zone is dread, and another <laughs> part of the experience of sort of. Exploring Exploring the features of this project is that all of the zone names are references to pieces of culture. And so you kind of have to try to figure out where they might have come from. Like this palette is reminiscent of a magic card called Liliana. It's a, one of the planeswalkers, but of on all of the instances of that character in the Magic the Gathering universe, this color palette more or less is present. Man, I love that. I I will admit on this podcast for the first time I used to play Magic the Gathering at lunch. Bro, you're so, not alone. This is the, there's a <laughs> the Venn diagram of Magic the Gathering fan, either former fans, collectors, players, and NFT people is very. It's basically one circle. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, I was also happy to hear about people who played Pokemon cards, as I've uh, joined the community and gotten deeper. I, I thought it was only me. No, this is super cool, and I love this color scheme. And, and to your point, he, I actually, I've really been getting into uh, Pepe's and, and fake Pepe's and rare Pepe's lately. So the uh, the Terraform that I picked up was from the Pepo palette because I love that nod to to Pepe there. Okay, so so the other perhaps uh, most obvious visual characteristic here uh, is is chroma, I believe, and uh, just. From from what you guys were saying earlier, chroma is just simply how how quickly it moves. Is that correct? Yeah, it's basically the rate that the animation cycles at. And what are the different options? I know there's flow. I believe there's also hyper. Is it just the two? So there's there's also pulse, where you could call pulse medium speed, but it, the pulsing nature of it makes it look kind of like a strobe effect, depending on which which terraform you're looking at pulses is, is one that really brings out certain zone biome combinations to my own tastes and other times i just don't care for it at all but there's also a fourth chroma of which there will only ever be nine uh, right now there are there are seven revealed plagues that plague is the fourth chroma and there will be two more there there are two more unrevealed ones that we know we know exist in the thousand terraforms that the math castles studio team has but yeah, those are sort of like the um, 
you could think of them as like the alien crypto punks of the Terraforms universe, maybe. Yeah, none for sale today. No, those are extremely rare. And they're like super seizure warning, fast strobe effect. And actually with the upgrade that's coming, I think going to get like even crazier. <laughs> there's like a, there's an upgrade that's coming that nobody knows when it'll ship, but it's being actively worked on and talked about. And one of the changes is that plagues are going to get plague gear. Yeah. And in, in addition to that, uh, I think that we might see some sort of like uh, me mechanics introduced surrounding plagues. Um, previously it had been discussed that we might see something like the ability for a terraform of a specific biome to be sort of sacrificed to the plague and then it could take on the characteristics and possibly other terraform owners could interact with with it in some way but we're still sort of waiting on explicit details of that um, if you want to see what a plague looks like 8322 is an example of of that chroma in action you you read my mind i was just going to ask that okay interesting I have to say, he every single time we pull one up, uh, I'm seeing who the owner is on screen, and the only thing that varies is the amount of e's in the in the dot e eth address here. <laughs> oh yeah, I I'm browsing my own collection when I'm looking for examples, just because I I'm comfortable with knowing where it is I can go find a certain behavior that I'm looking for. No, I just think it's impressive and a, a true testament to not only the passion but the breadth of knowledge and collecting that you've done. It's impressive. I've spent far too much time looking at these things, but I love it. Just enough time. Just enough time. <laughs> no, the, this is fantastic. It, it's it's reminiscent of probably how many hours I've spent in the Chromie Squiggles collection. It, it's just it's really really admirable to hear two other individuals with a, such an expansive knowledge uh, of a collection. It, it's it's so invigorating. I'm so excited. I'm like firing up my ledger right now, trying to buy some. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's also, I think that's an interesting like point that it's a collection that rewards that kind of attention, right? Like people talk about long form generative art. This is a piece where it being a 10,000 piece set is, I think, really well justified. And there's a depth and a range in the piece that that rewards spending a lot of time. I mean, I'm sure he has this experience. And even 113, the creator of the piece says this sometimes, he's like, sometimes I'm just looking at stuff and I see something and I'm like, whoa, what is that? You know what I mean? Like it's it has that kind of, you can really spend a lot of time with it and still see things that are feel fresh and surprising. No, that's that's awesome. And I love how we're we're teasing out some of these things like that. The grass characteristic was just absolutely mind blowing. The, one of the last traits here is mode. I think there's five different mode types. What is it from your guys' perspective that distinguishes between each of these? Yeah, so I can speak to this. So basically, the, the different modes go back to what he mentioned earlier on, which is the state of it with regard to the kind of drawing program functionality. So depending on the mode, it can be... So it starts off in terrain mode, which is the original land art mode. Uh, and then you can take it into a daydream mode, which is where you can then make your own ASCII art style drawing. And then if you choose to, you can commit that back to the chain by taking it into Terraform mode. And this is, I think this is actually a really, for me, For it took a little while for me to assimilate kind of like the meaning of this in the context of the whole artwork. On one hand, when you first think, or at least for me, you encounter it and you think, oh, that's a little bit of like a kind of a funny novelty. And I was kind of like, oh, I don't want to draw over the, the original. I really like the original kind of landform art. And I was like, this is kind of weird. And then people were like writing their names on them and, and, putting like memes on them and stuff. And I was kind of like, ah, I'm not sure if I like this. It's kind of like graffitiing this beautiful landscape. But I think the really important thing that this points to and that is only possible in the piece is because it's a dynamically computed runtime artwork, right? These are not outputs. They are visualizations of an ongoing process. And that's why they can change, right? And they can take in data 
and represent that data and even have that data be rewritten, right? So an important detail about the modes is that going from terrain mode to daydream mode is a one-time destructive operation. But then once you go to terraform mode, you can go back to daydream mode and rewrite and redraw and overwrite. You just can't go back to the kind of original state. And then that brought up this kind of little meta game kind of thing where a bunch of us in the beginning bought up all the parcels on level five and said, this is a nature preserve and we're never going to daydream these and never draw on them and keep them in their pristine state. Uh, which has kind of worked and then, <laughs> of course, not 100% worked. So that's interesting. How has the community rallied around this whole concept of, I'll call it exiting terrain mode for, because I, I, I was scrolling through the collection that's up for sale right now. And there's one that's like a, a Bitcoin symbol. There's a few that look like people have converted them into a, a punk aesthetic. I mean, I, I agree with you that it's a departure from the original intent, but it's interesting how the owner is able to influence it. How is, do you go a little bit deeper into how the community has either embraced or potentially not embraced that? Sure, yeah. I think early on, there were some people who are really technical, who sort of dove into starting, starting to play with it more as like a, an art form instead of a, an etch sketch Like you'll, you'll see that most of the Terraform parcels look like someone might have just sort of quickly drawn something as if it were paint and then sort of committed it to canvas which is cool and you know there's lots of memes and um some of the memes get repeated in the discord server and that's fun but then there are other people who are sort of trying to make it feel more i don't know like something other than a sketch uh like one of the the first i think the earliest one i saw that made me stop and go oh that's that's actually really cool would be 5535 that one you'll recognize the face but you know, it looks cool and you can copy that height map and you can terraform it onto other parcels, but it's, I don't think it's going to have the same impact as it does on this specific zone and biome. It just works very nicely. 1875 is one I saw recently that's kind of cool. And this is made by another one of the early community members who sort of fools around with, uh, oh, sorry, 1873, my mistake, sort of fools around with trying to push the constraints of of this mode around, but I would say it's going to get an awful lot more interesting in a couple of weeks. So you mentioned earlier that, uh, that excitement in Terraforms more broadly sort of picked up recently. And part of that is because like the period of time before the initial mint, where 113 would sort of just show up in Discord unannounced and start a live stream with some sparse context, but with people sort of left guessing what's going on. Well, a couple of months ago, he started doing that with the Daydream update, which has been coming, which will make parcels that are sitting in sort of the native blank canvas Daydream mode look a lot more visually interesting, but will also give people who want to terraform parcels, I think, a bit more latitude in the creations they make that way as well. So over time, I think we'll see an awful lot more parcels Daydreamed and terraformed, and I think we'll see a much broader array of outputs from it. So I'm, I'm curious to see what happens this year. It introduces a really interesting gamification because then there's going to be these, if the terrain trait, which is clearly the most common right now, starts to evaporate as they transition into more of these terraform or daydream type of modes, especially with the artistic, the individual's artistic intent coming through. There's almost this uh, originality to the terrain trait that uh, will become more and more rare. It's, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. Yeah, I think that's definitely true, and there is a kind of a there is a kind of a deflationary element to it that definitely will kind of affect the way that people are collecting. And I think that, as he alludes to, the this update that's coming is going to have a pretty significant effect. I think on the the way that the daydream parcels appear and is pro there's a lot of collectors in the discord who've been saying you know they didn't want to daydream things before but now with when the update comes is going to they they're going to want to you know and uh so i think we may see like a little shift in behavior soon yeah and and prior to the update so in the current status quo from my understanding the vast majority of these were in train mode because as soon as you daydream it or terraform it your, it, it seemed like it was less desirable. Is that correct? I mean, I, I wouldn't 
make the judgment that it's necessarily less desirable if you do that. But I would say that because it's irreversible, you lose some optionality as the owner of that NFT. So, you know, uh, it, it makes sense, all else being equal, that on an average collector might value a Terraform without that optionality slightly less than one with it. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think the other thing that's interesting that is possible in the contract is that you can delegate the ability to draw to someone else and so kind of like commission somebody to draw on your Terraform without transferring it out of your wallet. So it's a kind of a, which also then should, depending on kind of like what wallet they use, but should record, kind of record the provenance of that drawing onto the chain, which is which is something that hasn't been like extensively done or valued in the collection yet. But I think especially after the Daydream update, we may see more artists or potentially like prominent artists making drawings on the pieces. And and that may change also the economics around collecting them that like, yeah, the one we have on screen here with the Bitcoin symbol, right? Maybe that's not something that people are like, wow, amazing. I have to have that. Or maybe some, you know, Bitcoin maxis might feel that way. But once you have some kind of unique piece of artwork there, I think that calculus may change. I would add to uh, that you can also because it's just delegating authority to a contract or to a, a wallet address, you can delegate authority to a contract. And so theoretically, somebody could make some kind of Ethereum game or smart contract or whatever that reconfigured the state of a parcel based on the actions of many people as opposed to just one or based on the actions of the blockchain or, you know, based on some computer logic. Like, because you can delegate it to a smart contract, there are an awful lot of things that you could do while still retaining custody of the asset yourself. Oh, wow, that's super cool. So then you could say, you know, certain conditions are met, it goes from Terraform back to Daydream, and maybe somebody or some group then gets to re-Terraform it to whatever they want, and you run another iteration of the game, something along those lines. Yeah, and actually we've seen, I don't know if they actually succeeded in doing it, but uh, when the party bid V2 update to that protocol released, which now allows you to do like group arbitrary on-chain actions. There was a group of people led by Rayhan from FWB who were trying to, I think, buy a, buy a Terraform and Terraform it as a group using Party Bid 2, which was, which was pretty interesting. I'm not sure if they actually did it or not, but I know they were trying to do it. Yeah, this is super cool. And I actually wanted to to show you all something, which you, you probably have already seen, uh, but Dmitry Cherniak, who's known for Ringers, actually, it, he talks about getting one of his first big successes was doing some Taylor Swift ASCII art. And uh, it, it just made me think about that. I don't know if, you know, the character, the, the biomes here would, would be able to recreate any of these, but I think, you know, you, you can have some of these artists doing fantastic things here. And it also makes me think a little bit about QQL the uh, Tyler Hobbs uh, dandelion project where, you know, people bought these mint passes and then they could have an artist, somebody else create the image and then they could lock in their, their seed into that image. And of course, there's all these questions about how long are people going to hold those? When will they lock them in? Will some of them still be undefined a hundred years from now? Will those hold more value? I think a lot of really interesting dynamics that sound similar here. Yeah, I think it's a fair characterization to say that um, QQL as a project is adjacent to some of the ideas that Math Castle Studio has sort of already tried to bake into their work and some that I su suspect they will bake into future works over time. Uh, just one, one quick last question on the uh, the modes here, or at least my last question, Jared, of course, you can ask another one. But uh, there are a couple that are origin, origin daydreams, origin terraforms, I believe. So were those ones that were never in terrain mode? They just always started that way in uh, either daydream or terraform? Yes. So there were there were a group of people who were early supporters in the Discord uh, who each got to mint one origin daydream. So one of the mechanics of the castle, we haven't really talked about sort of the concept of Hyper castle, but we can get to that afterwards. But one of one of the mechanics of the, of the structure in sort of like the NFT world of terraforms is that it is programmed to degrade over time. So it's supposed to, after about ten thousand years, it will sort of disintegrate to nothing unless there are enough parcels in a dream state to to sort of slow it down to a halt. And so that decay rate is sort of 
correlated with uh, the number of parcels that are in dream mode. Um, and so in order to keep the castle from sort of spontaneously disintegrating, it had to be instantiated at the beginning with some number of daydreams. So the origin daydreams are in a way sort of like essence of the hypercastle, like the the lifeblood that sort of kept it together on day one. And so origin terraforms are just terraformed versions of these daydreams. But these terraforms were born in a daydream state and never had a terrain to speak of. And are some of the and are the only exception to the rule that they can go back and forth. They're not subject to that one way trip logic because they never well, I guess because they never were in a terrain state. So but they cannot go back to a train state. The, I mean, they were never in a train state. Yeah, exactly. They can. No, 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 no. Got it. Got it. And are those uh, tend to be more coveted amongst collectors? Yeah, I think um, I think they were maybe a bit slept on for quite a while. But once one one three started teasing the daydream update, people became, I would say, intensely interested in them because daydreams just look. I mean, I don't know exactly what they're going to look like upon deploy, but it looks like they're going to look incredible. And I, every parcel can be turned into a daydream, but these ones are just sort of raw daydreams. And one other thing I should say about that upgrade is that it is completely opt-in. So there's uh, in the smart contract, there's an array of modes that the user can opt into. And so if you want your Terraform to continue acting the way that it does today, you'll be able to do that forever. But if you want to instead opt into the new recommend, recommended version of sort of how they behave and animate, then you can change that in the smart contract yourself and opt into the new deployment. Yeah. So you guys have mentioned this update a couple times now. What is there like a quick summary or a, you know, what it means for collectors? Do we have all the details on that? I can't say that we have the, all the details, but essentially, there's a visual update to daydreams. Uh, I, I think we might see the visual update to plagues to make them uh, more plaguey, as Matto put it, but I'm not certain of that. And then there's also this concept of antennas and satellites. And so what an antenna is, is you can take any Terraform and put it into daydream mode, and then you can toggle it to antenna on post update if you've opted into the new deployment. And in antenna on mode, your daydream parcel will sort of have this base awaiting for signal animation. Uh, but then what satellites are is they're essentially smart contract deployments made by math castles or collaborators, which will transmit a generative art signal that can be received by daydreamed parcels with their antennas on. And so if there are one or more satellites that are deployed at any given time, then you can take your antenna mode on daydream and sort of like you toggling radio stations, you can pick up on these signals that are coming from satellites and have your daydream ingest the code and then exhibit the behavior of the generative art signal that it's consuming. So it's kind of like a distribution model for MathCastle Studios to release experimental generative artworks to be consumed directly on Terraforms without sort of worrying about either the work not landing or about sort of, I know that I know that the team is somewhat sensitive to sort of supply concerns as are many collectors, as are many artists. And so it's a way for them to sort of do a lot of art without actually creating a lot of supply. Uh, and so it, it should be pretty interesting to see how people respond to that once it's live. Yeah, I got to say that's one of the aspects of the update that I'm most kind of excited about and interested in. And I think it's, you know, one of the things that I think that is really interesting about Terraforms and about the kind of aesthetic ethos that 113 is pretty actively pushing of this kind of idea of runtime art or dynamic networked artworks is that the satellites, antenna and satellites kind of feature is going to really, in my mind, it really helps people to understand that. Or it's like a real kind of actualization of this idea of like multiple software programs talking to each other, generating a dynamic signal that then, you know, manifests as either visible or invisible artwork. And I think that is one of the kind of directions that this whole project and 
some of the kind of thinking that 113 has been put putting forward, this kind of runtime art scene that I think is really, really exciting and that I think we're going to see a lot of interesting explorations in, in, in the you know near future. Oh, this is so cool. I, I'm going to just get one thing in and, and then Jared uh, is going to transition us to a little bit about the hypercastle. But I think this is so cool because, I mean, yes, you can satellite and put up your antenna and get different art, but you could get all sorts of things. Like you could get a, a message, right? You could get, I don't know if you could do a QR code, but you could, I, I don't know. I just think that this sort of uh, radio concept and it's something that we could just all get really creative with and it could just be, I, I don't know. I, I'm not articulating this well, so, so I'll stop, but I think it's just a really cool interactivity that we haven't seen before, especially in generative art. I agree that it's really cool. It unlocks a lot of potential uh, and it really allows for a lot of flexibility and it, it's created a, a really interesting dynamic that I don't know if, I've particularly heard of in any other project. It, it's a, it's really intriguing, honestly. Yeah, one 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 three will tell you himself that sort of like the um, the concept of it either is a three D world, which is something that people sort of uh, are drawn to and understand, or just sort of the the basic uh, representation as a two D generative artwork that sort of you know evokes the same kinds of things that maybe uh, an art blocks project or something would for someone. Those things are, are almost like uh, like bait to get people through the threshold so that they can start getting exposure to these sort of uh, more abstract and, and more like, uh, you can call it runtime art or whatever you like, but sort of more medium native behaviors where you're talking about multiplayer network art rather than just an output that's stored on chain. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's ultimately creating uh, a in my opinion, a, a deeper ingrained community, one that has a not only a vested interest, but a, a very dynamic contribution potential. So it kind of blowing my mind uh, real time. I mean, you touched on it, but the the hypercastle being an entry point for, for people to wrap their heads around, other than given the levels and the XYZ coordinates, is there any other component to it that uh, that you guys would feel is necessary to maybe touch on well I, I would say the first half of that word hyper sort of alludes to not just the one structure but so so basically the the version of the castle that we experience as an nft collection called terraforms is just one seed of the hyper castle so one seed was put into this machine and then an nft collection was minted based on sort of this canonical instance of the hypercastle but you could put any seed in and you could generate you know an invisible iteration of any version of the hypercastle you wanted to so i i know that <clears throat> 113 deliberately tried to avoid uh evoking sort of like uh, old school roguelikes with the visual design of terraforms although if you like those things you can clearly see the hints of it baked in all over the place but if you were to, for example, imagine, you know, a roguelike RPG game, you might have it set in sort of the canonical hypercastle. You know, maybe you start on level seven in the intro forest or whatever, and you start fighting boars. But uh, you, you can imagine a world where you could sort of seamlessly step between dimensions, which are completely different seeds of the hypercastle. And so completely different parallel worlds. And, you know, there are an infinity of them in theory. Yeah, I mean... You see it on screen right now. I mean, the just the the coloration in between levels. It's it's indicative of these potential different worlds, and you, you could definitely see the the game like nature that you're referring to starting to exist. Uh, different clans could emerge, or teleporting between each of them becomes a you know a completely viable thing just through through the aesthetics. It, it's interesting. A, a question for you, he. Have there been any other instantiations of the hyper castle in the sense that, okay, the one that everybody is sort of trading around right now is this one that has 11,000 parcels, 9,910 of which are currently kind of easily available. And we're looking at that canonical instance, as you mentioned. Are there any others floating out there that people interact with that may look different, have a different number of parcels, et cetera? Like, like has anyone done that yet? Not that I'm aware of, but I think that we'll see people 
exploring a lot of different ideas in the future. But there's one in particular that I'm fascinated with. And I would love to set aside some time to start working on it at some point in the future. But I, I'm sure we'll see people do some interesting things with it. Like to to digress slightly, like uh, people talk about the word metaverse or a metaverse as sort of like some 3D world that people hang out in. In my estimation, in my my personal perspective, metaverse is more so the sum of all of the things that are on chain for people to build stuff out of. Like I view Ethereum, for example, or even the sum of blockchains that people deploy things to that we think are relatively robust as almost like a a GitHub repository, not just for programs, but also for culture. And so I think the more programs and culture and, you know, worlds like the Hypercastle and whatever else is put on Ethereum over time, the more powerful that entire network is for people who want to create things and compose them of the disparate pieces that exist there. And so to me, Metaverse is sort of the long-term inevitable outcomes from that kind of dynamic rather than a specific place or, you know, some VR experience, for example. Right, right. And and actually that that was one of the questions is that people say that Terraform is sort of like a a metaverse, but it's if I'm understanding you correctly, it's not a metaverse in the sense of some 3D world like other deeds where you can visualize and walk around. It's really more about those connections and the way that these different instantiations of the math castle could connect with each other. Yeah, I, I would say it's an artwork, and I think that. The concept of metaverse, as I understand it, is something that applies equally to this type of artwork as it does to, you know, a profile picture that's on chain or some other thing that is sort of we can we can be certain will be accessible in the long term on a blockchain. Therefore, we can make decisions about building things that interact with it and know that they'll still be there. Got it. That makes sense. And and tell me if this question doesn't make sense. I'm just trying to fully wrap my head around it. If I wanted to spin up an instantiation of this with a different seed, how would I do that? Is is it just you take the open source code and get it onto Ethereum or you know what what would that process look like? Well, all of the contracts for the project are on chain, so you'd have to find the uh the function that you call to put in that input, but then you know you could put in that input and see what the output is as a result of that thing. But I, I believe in the the contract that is directly related to the NFTs, that seed is uh, it's not dynamic. It's baked right in there. Got it. Got it. That makes sense. And I guess what, maybe like a broad question, like as you all learned about the Hypercastle and as you think about it now, what kind of possibilities do you think could emerge from it that that haven't yet? I think it's, for me, the one of the most important things about it as a piece is pointing to this kind of different image or mental model of NFTs as dynamic computer programs, right? We've had very much a meta of NFTs as hashes to images stored on IPFS or stored on chain, right? I think that the, there's an important, people talk about Terraforms as an on-chain project, which of course it is, but I think it's, you can also talk about, you know, I don't, I won't single out any one project, right? But projects which take their static image elements, encode them to SVG, and then upload them to a chain, right? You're essentially using uh, Ethereum as a content delivery network, which is very different from calculating and simulating a dynamic piece of software on Ethereum, right? So I think Terraforms is is kind of important in that regard because it's this dynamic artwork that is running and being simulated, you know, as we speak and then displaying its outputs. And I think that's something that hasn't really widely propagated through the NFT ecosystem yet and uh, and is something that I'm excited to, to see kind of continue to grow. No, that makes a lot of sense. Curveball question, but... I mean, as I'm listening to each of you speak, it just becomes so obvious to me that this is such a an incredible project with a breadth that's hard to quantify. I mean, 
there's a reference to like a Tyler Hobbs Fidenza earlier. And it's like, it's really easy. Traits are here. Everything's locked in. But this seems to be in ever expanding, ever developing ecosystem. How do you, each of you, he and Motto, how do you guys grasp that? And I know you're like eating, sleep and breathing this stuff, but you know, it's, it's, it's intriguing. Uh, and, and I feel like I could definitely see how you guys have gone down a, a rabbit hole because the, the more you scratch the, the surface, the more intrigued you are to keep diving in. Sure. Yeah. I mean, the, what I, I've been interested in over time continues to change, right? At first, it was this mysterious 3D world that looked, you know, interesting, but I didn't know what it was. And then there was a period of time where I was just sort of obsessed with exploring the aesthetic qualities of the 2D artwork onto itself. There's a website called enterdream.xyz, which uh, is pretty popular. Uh, and it allows you to superimpose a profile picture on top of a terraform and so that that's become a very popular pastime for people you see a lot of pfps in the discord server that have uh, animated terraforms in the background so that was something i i got into playing around with a lot early last year but then once you go a little bit deeper you can start thinking of sort of the 3d structure and ways that you could build experiences that interact with that. Like for example, there are a few folks right now who are trying to build like a sort of a, a VR enabled art gallery where you can actually go around and, and look at NFTs you've loaded into an instance of Terraform's terrain. There's the Hyper Castle Explorer that Matto built where you can, you know, you could take your, I have a Steam Deck and I, I loaded that up onto that. And I was at home showing my parents how I could fly around through this piece of artwork in a, a visualization that is, you know, com completely, well, not completely divorced. I mean, it has a lot of the characteristics of the 2D art, but it is a completely different representation of the same sort of ideas based on the sort of invisible data structure. But then there's also the terraforms are sort of a substrate for art, an angle where you can fool around with terraforming things to them. But the thing that you terraform to it is also, it's a height map. So it represents a 3D space. So you can imagine how you might interpret and represent that in different ways. And you've got other folks in the community who are sort of calling Terraform's art supplies for computer art. And then they're they're writing code that takes the different features of Terraform's, their, their dynamic behavior, and they're making dynamic artworks that take the dynamic characteristics of Terraform's as sort of like a paintbrush and injecting itself into this other visual representation, which has its own, you know, generative art algorithm or whatever, and creates a new piece of artwork that is sort of directly derivative of the terraform, but completely different. And then the longer you hang around the Discord, sorry for rambling, but the longer you hang around the Discord, uh, and the more you hear 113 speak, and the more you hear some of the people who are really deeply entrenched in the community talk about their thoughts and ideas you realize that at the core of all this is sort of this idea of computer program art and sort of trying to explore ways that we can make artwork that really only makes sense in the context of you know a network of computers that have multiple people fooling around on them where it's not just sort of something that you can imagine in another medium and then inject into this one, but it's sort of its own thing. And so that's where people play with terms like runtime art or some other phrases that people are sort of tossing around trying to uh, wrap their heads around what to call all of this stuff. But I think like it's sort of a progression from the more superficial to some of those ideas over time. And then other stuff that you know I'm sure will become apparent to me later. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think that's one of the things that 113 primarily and and also Exaltgeist, you know, have done a really good job with is fostering a community, especially during the kind of speculative mania of the bull market. There was a moment where, you know, everything was kind of going insane. There was the kind of mania around loot. And they managed to not be kind of mobbed by the swarm of speculators and kind of grow an organic community through that period of folks who were quite interested in all the things that he just described really well. 
And that has allowed the project and the community to kind of grow organically, really develop a, a set of kind of com- a kind of a community ethos and set of values and turn into something that feels more like a scene and less than like just a discord or kind of a group of collectors of one artwork. Yeah, I, I love this. And I've been thinking a lot about how the medium of blockchain changes the art. And one instantiation of that is long form generative art with the randomization that allows each output to be unique, but has the fingerprints of that collector on that output. And uh, this is another evolution of that because I think what part of what you're saying is with this runtime art, not only is the art dynamic, but this whole structure is impossible to make without the network, without all of the people who are participating being a part of it. And I think that's actually really, really interesting and different. And I know that's it's not completely runtime. Uh, maybe that's not the exact definition of runtime, but it does seem like this experience is not possible without having both the blockchain and a, a big network of, of people who are all contributing and participating in this. Yeah. I Just to jump in, I think that's really correct. And obviously this word runtime art, I don't know if that's the term that we're all going to settle on, right? As like the way to describe all this. There's been a, a big search, I think, for a good name, good shorthand to describe this as more than just Terraforms, which I which I do think is kind of the direction that it's going in. But I think this is something that 113 has really kind of put pressure on is what is the thing to do with this medium that is really specific to this medium that really takes advantages of the unique affordances of this medium and that tries to do something both durable and kind of that really exactly as you say could not exist anywhere else and i think i think that's kind of like the provocation that's kind of the challenge right and then he's kind of thrown down the gauntlet to say okay you know what next yeah, absolutely. And, you know, when at the start of the episode, you talked about how you can think of it in three different levels, the project, the just the 2D art, the 3D hypercastle. And you mentioned one element of the hypercastle and he, you, you were just talking about it as well, or really the 3D nature, how each of these parcels has an elevation, which is really more visible here on this enterdream.xyz website, which by the way, this is so cool. I'm, I'm glad the viewers are going to be able to see this. And it's really cool to see it in real time. Uh, although it is kind of a, a computer starting to struggle a little bit. I especially like this Mario Kart star down here. I don't know if it's meant to be Mario Kart, but that's how I'll interpret it. But w- with the elevation, are folks uh, able to do anything with that yet? Or is that something uh, that we you think you'll see more experimentation with in the future? Well, I- I mean, in theory, right, it's it's sort of just, it's a computer program, well, like a series of computer programs that are sort of just an artwork under themselves. And, you know, there's, it's there and it will persistently be there on the blockchain. So if somebody wants to do something like, for example, create a Unity SDK for this thing that allows people to sort of reference this living, breathing on-chain artwork and then reinterpret it in a 3D game engine environment, well, then you can do that. And that's exactly what, what Matto did with, with his studio when he created the Hypercastle Explorer and the Unity SDK to go along with that. But really, I mean, you're, you're not going to see the Math Castles team themselves, I don't think, create a 3D video gaming experience for people to fool around in this world. But that doesn't preclude somebody else from doing something like that or doing some b- bizarre thing that nobody's thought of yet. But, uh, you know, it, it's kind of... It's open to whatever folks want to build, I think. Got it, got it. And having that elevation in there allows for more experiences that could be built on top of it. Is that right? Sure, yeah. I mean, th- there are a number of different um, sort of experimental things that folks have made where you can you, know, you can plop a character in and sort of run around the, uh, the parcel as interpreted by an engine they made inside of the browser, whatever. So, I mean, you, you can imagine... You can imagine that someone could interpret it in a wide variety of ways. Part of the reason that that folks throw around the sort of invisible art notion in that community is the fact that this is sort of just like a a, a substrate for interpretations. And so the the, the two dimensional artwork you see of the canonical hypercastle in the NFT collection that's sort of just like one interpretation of this computer program code 
that is an artwork unto itself. And so you can interpret that that idea in a wide variety of different ways visually if you'd like to. Got it. Thank you for explaining that. That, that makes a ton of sense, actually. And I'm, I'm just like still trying to <laughs> wrap my head around all of this in terms of now I get some of the principles and like what possibilities could be out there. But while I'm still thinking about that, Matt, at, at the beginning, you mentioned that the, the third level in which you could think about terraforms beyond the hypercastle is as this sort of real time computer. And have there, maybe you could explain that a little bit more. Is that really like the, the runtime art concept? Or are there any other things that people have thought about in terms of, you know, maybe going beyond art or, or whatever else this could be given that is, if you think of it truly as a, as a computer rather than just an image animated or otherwise? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think this is one of the things that I think is a is a relatively core component of the piece, which is I think and I think I mean, I've heard 113 say things like this. I don't want to like misquote him or put words in his mouth. Right. But but the idea that the computer program is the actual artwork and everything else are kind of visualizations of it and that there is no there is no single definitive visualization of it right so we can think of these as kind of views of something of an underlying simulation right and i think this theme of simulation is a really important one because one of the things that's part of the kind of discussion around the piece is the idea of what are or or i think one of the kind of themes around the piece is what are the what are compute what do computer native artworks look like and one of the things that kind of only computers can do in terms of art media is simulation, right? Is simulate environments. Probably the most popularly familiar form of this is video games, right? All of us who play video games have experience of interacting with simulated worlds, right? Where there are physics and rules and maybe sometimes very strange and non-realistic rules, right? And I think that this kind of medium of simulation is one of the things that terraforms is kind of speaking to deeply and and in the case of in the context of ethereum and nfts the fact that the structure itself the the artwork itself is a dynamically running simulation on ethereum right so any of the visuals that you are looking at can and do change right so to just like dive deep into the technical weeds for a second, the way that the piece is rendered is that it's what's called a Perlin noise field, which generates these kind of like smoothly varying gradients that we see that are that appear in the height maps, right? Both in the context of the elevations within the levels and then in the context of the, the parcels themselves, right? So like what we can see on screen, these kind of hills and valleys, right? This is generated by taking the light parts of a Perlin noise texture. Uh, and you can even just, if you just Google Perlin noise, you can like see an image of it, right? It might actually help to look at it. You'll see it's this kind of, sm just go to images or yeah, any of these, right? These are, these are, and actually that's a good example, right? Where we can see the light parts of the Perlin noise are rendered at higher elevations and the dark parts are, are rendered lower, right? And this is a, this is not a concept unique to Terraforms, right? This is widely used in computer graphics and video games all over the place most commonly like for things like terrain generation right which which is kind of the way it's interpreted in terraforms so this simulation this uh, set of heights and hills and valleys is actually calculated dynamically on chain in the solidity code right so this is what we say when we're talking about a dynamic artwork it's not a picture of hills and valleys it's a dynamic kind of world generation of hills and valleys like you might see to use a video game comparison in something like Minecraft, right? If you start playing Minecraft, you run a process once, it dynamically generates this world, and then you can go run around in it, right, and, and punch trees. In this case, we're dynamically simulating the world on Ethereum continuously, right? Which is why you can see the artwork change. And I think this is the kind of under, when we say, you know, the real artwork is the computer program, this is the kind of, that is kind of the the third and maybe the lowest level that we're that we're thinking about, and I think is one of the things that is most you know innovative about about the piece. Sorry to drop a giant monologue on you guys, but I think no, I I love that, and I I wanted to ask just to help me 
sorted out in my mind. How would you differentiate this from, say, a code-based generative art? Is the idea that this takes it a level further because the code is more dynamic than something that created code-based images, but those images never really change? I think that's basically it. That you, If you look at, if, for example, you were looking at take your favorite generative art piece and it changed every day, right? You would have a piece that's dynamic, right? If you were running the algorithm every day and it would vary slightly, then it would be dynamic. And what you're seeing with, you know, most, like, let's say pieces on art blocks, right? There's this kind of pachinko process where you drop a ball in the top, it bounces around the algorithm, generates a certain output, uh, and then you get your image at the bottom, right? Which is a kind of a snapshot of that algorithm being run with a certain seed value, which is a beautiful and innovative idea in and of itself, right? But then the, the next stage is that algorithm is continuously running, right? It's not, we're not looking at a photograph of the algorithm. We're looking at a, a video of the algorithm, right? We're seeing the algorithm being run and calculated dynamically. I would also just add to that quickly that it's, it's dynamic in a way that is also interactive. Whereas, you know, you'll see with some, for example, Familiars uh, came out not too long ago. It's a popular project. And right now that, that NFT project has these cute little characters and their sort of mood and their, their animation and whether or not they're dancing is a matter of a price feed to a specific crypto asset like Bitcoin or Ethereum. If Ethereum goes up, they're happy. And if it goes down, they're sad. And so that's sort of like a, a static type of dynamic behavior, whereas in the world of Terraforms, the entire structure itself behaves according to how many of the Terraforms are in a dream state. And then also the individual Terraforms themselves can be interacted with either by the owner or by people or contracts who have been delegated authority to. Right. That, that makes sense. And to some extent with this uh, update, if you have your antenna up, it could be delegated by whichever satellite signal you are picking up on. Yes. Yeah, got it. And and I guess gazers is similarly uh, unidirectional where you can see your gazer change, but you can't influence its image. Yeah, gazers, uh, mutant gar garden seeders are both great examples of dynamic generative art pieces that sort of the, the manner in which they are dynamic is sort of statically defined. Right, right. And are, do you see any instances of oracles being utilized in terraforms or is that something that you could see coming up if it's not already happening i have seen terraforms used sort of as an oracle for something before but i've never i, I don't know about uh the project sort of ingesting one from somewhere yeah like uh, you, you mentioned the finiliaries and i wonder if it, you know J jared had that uh, i forget which terraform number it was but he mentioned one that looks like a bitcoin symbol and I wonder if you could even have a satellite station, say, which is similar, and it, it turns into a smiley face when Bitcoin's going up in price and turns into a frowny face when it's going down or something like that. So almost like recreating that Finilier uh, experience without the art, but that same kind of dynamic. I mean, that's, that is one of, because the, uh, you can delegate authority to daydream a parcel to, a, to an arbitrary contract, you could totally build that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so... It, you know, I guess as, as we're coming up on time here, I, I want to think more about the the future of Terraforms. We have this update that one one three is pushing out. Uh, do you, do you guys know when that's coming out, or is there a potential ETA on that? Uh, hy hypothetically, sometime around the end of January, but there's there's been no date committed to. And you know, generally, uh, with uh, with one one three D and Exalt guys, you sort of just You'll get a little bit of notice, but they sort of, they'll work away until they're really happy with it and then they'll let us know. But I would expect, you know, in a few weeks uh, is a likely scenario. Yeah, that sounds about right to me. You never know. <laughs> now, are there, have they talked about any concrete or not plans for beyond that? You know, like a, a bigger update that's being worked on or some idea that they feel strongly about that you all think might come to fruition? So I would say it's probably pragmatic not to expect anything in the future beyond that, regardless of what they may or may not do. And I'm going to attach to that idea that I, I'm not I'm not certain that uh, this project or other works by this studio are 
particularly good vehicles for investment because they're so uh, esoteric and because they're not marketed and because they're just sort of weird to wrap your head around that I'm not, I'm not sure how digestible they are by sort of every single person in NFTs. And so I would encourage folks who are thinking about maybe dipping their toes in to first do a lot of reading and see how you feel about it. Matto's YouTube video is a wonderful place to start. Uh, there's also an awesome article by I Like Calculus called Ode to Terraforms, which gives you a bit more, uh, a deeper dive on on so, sort of the idea of the hypercastle. But I would encourage you to sort of do some re research. And then if you decide that you want to sort of buy one of these things, you treat it as an artwork that is as it is that you're purchasing with money you don't need because you love it rather than sort of a a speculative investment in the startup. I do expect that we'll see more work from Math Castle Studio that is thematically linked to Terraforms. It might even sort of exist in, in the same sort of lore or universe as Terraforms, but I would not have the expectation that owning Terraforms NFTs gives you any sort of preferential treatment in, in regards to future artworks from the studio. They do have a project coming out which we do not know the date of, but the first few pieces from it have already been minted on chain. And that's a, a zero knowledge project that is tentatively labeled zero, but you know it might be months or longer before we find out any sort of concrete details about that project. Yeah, actually, I'm glad you brought that up. I was gonna ask you about that. And in general, you know, we have our disclaimer at the end of this episode, but always good to reiterate that these things are expensive. We're over three third floor. So looking at, you know, 4,500 US dollars at a minimum at current prices. And uh, it's, yeah, I, I totally agree. And, and this is not a project that is set up to or intended to increase in value. There's an artistic intent and sort of a technological and I don't even know what the word, network community intent here. So for the listeners, do not buy this with the expectation of making money, but you know, it's tough in our space, especially when you see Flamingo Dow buy like 80 of these. And I, I think that that is a challenge to balance here. But I think that everybody, again, emphasizing your point, would be best served if they interact with these and purchase these because they want to use them and not because they think it'll make them money. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with all that. And then I think that the other, just the, not not counter to that, but I think that one of the things that we've seen holistically in the nft space is just this incredibly short time horizon thinking right it's really rare in you know traditional art collecting to think that you're going to buy a piece buy a painting and then flip it for 10x three months later right it's kind of deranged right and that's that's one of the unique things about this space and and i'm not saying even that that's exactly a bad thing right the liquidity and the way the whole market works i think is part of what makes the space work. So I'm not hating on flippers or anything, but at the same time, you know, for me, I think this is a this is a a studio and a project that is has a long-term intention to be great, right? And so the way that I think about it is as something that that I'm happy to own for a long time uh and that might be an important piece in the future. Uh, you know, and and that's kind of how I think about it. You know, I think the time horizon side of this is is like really important. But yeah, of course, it's like it's definitely. And I think that's actually one of the things that has attracted a lot of people was like during the bull mania, it was a place where people weren't just constantly shilling and pumping and talking about the floor price. And and for those of us who were kind of more interested in the art of the ideas, it was a little kind of bubble of relative sanity uh compared to a lot of the stuff that was going on at the time and and i think that actually attracted a certain crowd of people which is one of the things that that makes the community great yeah I, absolutely and i'll just say one last thing on it is that I, I love the innovation here and i think for people who are innovation geeks and like to play around with the concept or the actual new user experiences this is really cool like i, I love the satellite antenna and I love the fact that you can delegate your daydream for somebody else to Terraform. 
I think there's just a lot of really interesting interactivity. Really curious to hear what the zero knowledge project is, if it interfaces, how it utilizes zero knowledge as an art form as well. I just love how they're thinking about it and experimenting. And, you know, I, I do think that it's worth paying attention to for folks who even are not collecting because a lot of innovations come out when you're experimenting in this way and being creative. And by understanding even some of the high level technicalities, you might be able to utilize a new a new user experience, a new way of solving a problem that you're doing in something that's not even art related, right? Uh, and I'm talking really abstractly, but I think what's really cool about this space is that, that especially with the generative art and, and code-based art, you're, you're creating new code for the purpose of art, but that code could be repurposed for other things. And in that pursuit of creativity, you might discover something that is really, really valuable in a non-art context. So uh, to, sorry for a little bit of a riff there, but I, you know, I, the, kind of the last question we, we, we had here uh, was just where could, what's your recommendations for folks? You know, they've heard this, they kind of get the concept. How would you recommend they start collecting? I think, you know, I mean, he is much more of an expert collector than I am, but I would say join the Discord talk to people, obviously check out the resources that have been mentioned. There's also the community FAQ, which is a slide deck that's linked in the Discord in the Start Here channel. And I think, you know, something that he mentioned earlier, and that is, I think, kind of like the com general community advice is like, if you're going to buy something, just buy something that you like, right? Aesthetics first, then you'll be happy with it, whatever happens. And uh, it's good to understand all the different systems and how those impact royalty, you know, uh, how those impact rarity. But uh, but I think you know buy a piece that you like and you'll and you'll always be happy. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I, I would just add, recently there was a, a person who is a, a pretty well known collector of things in in NFTs as a very big collection, but they didn't come into the Discord server. They didn't consume any of the introductory or more advanced literature videos, etc. That that are out there to sort of get people up to speed they just sort of hopped onto an exchange and started buying things and so what they ended up doing actually was buying a whole bunch of terraformed parcels and i believe the reason they did this although i wasn't able to get through through to them to let them know what was going on but um i think the reason they did this is because they scored really highly in all the rarity tools because so few people have terraformed their parcels that they'll appear to be extremely rare. When in reality, these are just regular terraforms that the person was paying a premium amount for. And then I expect that they eventually did take the time to learn the true nature of these things because one day they listed all of them for a lot less money, unfortunately. So I would, I would really strongly encourage people to do a little bit of research, ask questions if you're not sure. And then as Matto said, if you're going to buy something, buy it because you love it and it looks nice. There are a lot of really beautiful terraforms that are very common. Fantastic advice. And I will second that if you hop in the Discord, there are many, many people there who are happy to help. They love terraforms, both he and Matto. Uh, I, I'm sure when you all are in there, you, you help folks out who are new and, and trying to navigate the space. So that's, uh, I, I think that's a wrap. We really, really appreciate it. Uh, Jared, maybe you go first. Where, where can folks find you? You can find me on Twitter at Jared underscore pause, P-O-Z, on Discord as J underscore pause. That's really where it is. I'm, I'm back in action and, and no scheduled vacation. So hit me up if you have any questions. That's, that's right. That's right. Awesome. And uh, he and Matto, is the Terraforms Discord the best place for folks to find you if they have any questions? Oh, uh, yeah. You can find me in the Terraforms Discord at all hours. Uh, I'm also on Twitter and Discord. Uh, my name is H with a lot of E's after it. Difficult to remember number of E's. <laughs> And yeah, I'm at Matto, double underscore Matto on Twitter. That's the easy place to find me. I'm in the Terraforms Discord and I'm Matto1231 on, uh, on Discord as well. So yeah, feel free to hit me up. That's awesome. And, and you know, I am at Aston Cloud on Twitter, at Aston Cloud and Discord. We are at collectors underscore XYZ. And, and he, I wanted to ask you, how did you, how do you remember the number of E's? Is it just, uh, did you always like remember that? I remember thinking, even when I was trying to find you on, on Twitter and stuff, I was like, man, this, this is going to be tough. Oh, it's, it's variable. I own most of the, 
the low number of E ENSs. Somebody has key with eight E's and are trying to sell it along with the spellings of Pranksy and other NFT collectors on, on OpenSea. But uh, I mean, the one that I have on Twitter, I have because that number of E's was available. Some platforms, I just max it out. But th there's no real rhyme or reason to it. It's uh, I created the name many years ago as a, an onomatopoeia for the sound of a barbarian in Diablo 2 leaping through the air as my Diablo 3 character. And then anyway, I, I made friends online and I've just been called that ever since. So it's just H with a lot of E's, not a specific number. Got it. Got it. That's amazing. Well, thank you both so much for taking the time on your days to share this with us and, and the audience. I think people are going to love it. And so we really appreciate you. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll, we'll pr try to bring you back for a round two. I, I know this goes deeper. Maybe we'll, we'll, we'll come back around uh, after we have the update out with the satellites and the antennas. Sounds good. Thanks for having us on, guys. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for all the knowledge, man. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you for tuning into Collector's Corner. We really appreciate you taking the time to listen. If you like this episode and want to help us out, please subscribe and leave us a review on your podcasting platform of choice like Apple Podcasts and Spotify and follow us on YouTube. Please also follow us on Twitter for announcements as we expand to other social and content platforms. Our Twitter handle is at collectors underscore XYZ. We'd also love to hear any feedback you have. So please comment or reach out. We're always striving to be more useful and get better so we can help you in your collecting journey. The Collector's Corner team and their guests are not registered investment advisors. All views expressed on this podcast are personal opinions and are not specific inducements to make particular investments or investment strategies and should not be relied upon for investment decisions. The show is solely for informational and entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, please consult a professional.